thanks Alejandro and thanks everybody for inviting me. And uh, thanks Mr. Yu for the final uh, um, call to action to the industry. I could not agree more with, uh, with, uh, the, the, with the view on, let me say, let's try it and let's make it work and let's push the adoption. Indeed, that is exactly what we have tried uh, to understand in our report. Uh, the report, first of all, you can find on all the, uh, our, the, the, um, on all the websites of uh, ICC, McKinsey, Fung Business Intelligence. Uh, and uh, it's a report that starts from the observation of what are the challenges of the global trade finance market. Let me share some of the exhibits that uh, you will find in the report itself uh, so that uh, we can uh, analyze the main insights. So first of all, uh, let's look at the size of this global market. Uh, trade finance can be defined in different ways. For the purpose of this report, we've looked only at the cross-border trade finance. So we've not included the domestic trade finance. So for instance, in many countries, invoice discounting is one instrument of doing trade finance for domestic purposes. Here, we've looked only at the cross-border. And if you look at the cross-border, I think especially for this group, uh, there are a couple of very interesting insights. First of all, uh, Asia Pacific represents more than half of the global trade finance volumes. And the other interesting element is that uh, the very vast majority of these volumes, which amount globally to $5.2 trillion annually, are related to documentary business, which is letters of credit guarantees, so basically unfunded instruments. While the funded instruments with uh, actual liquidity represent only the minority, 15%. If you look at these in terms of growth, the good news is that the funded part has been uh, steadily growing in the past years across all regions, especially the buyer-led uh, finance, so what is called also supply chain finance, where a large buyer is involved in uh, a financing program for the vendors, but still we're speaking about the minority of the flows. So as uh, Mr. Fung was saying uh, in his introduction, we have uh, spoken to many, many people in the industry. But first of all, we've spoken to the treasurers and owners of SMEs and mid caps around the world, especially in uh, emerging and developing markets. And uh, we have done, we've spoken with them for like 45, 50 minutes with each of them, trying to understand exactly what were they, what are their pain points when dealing with the trade finance uh, business? And, uh, you know, we, here we've tried to represent five examples of profiles of these treasurers and owners of, the, of SMEs. And you see that uh, the their profiles and their challenges are quite different in a sense, because you range from a very active entrepreneur that have maybe very high level of technology readiness, but they are struggling to access to financing markets, to situations of, let me say, more prudent business owners in medium-sized enterprises that are relatively low technology ready, but with a higher finance and market access. But when you listen to them and you validate these with the subject matter experts in the market, there are three messages that come out loud and clear. Uh, so, the first is that uh, the, um, there, are there are very common barriers in access to liquidity. This is due to the fact that often banks, for instance, find difficult to evaluate, uh, to assess the credit worthiness of SMEs that want to access to trade finance for many reasons. Availability of data, uh, um, the level of uh, timeliness of this data and, uh, and the fact that the data might not be up to date, uh, the fact that uh, some banks might struggle with understanding uh, uh, some types of risk like country risks. And so all of these, uh, let me say, makes, uh, despite the fact that the liquidity is, all, all, is often present in certain markets, uh, makes it uh, difficult for SMEs to access to this liquidity. The second element, which is uh, very common is that uh, there is a complex and labor intensive uh, uh, process for each transaction, right? So for instance, if you think about letters of credits, it's still uh, very manual and very difficult for many SMEs uh, 
uh, to elaborate the process. And the problem here is that we're not talking about large corporates with large back offices or administrative staff. Here we're speaking about uh, small medium enterprises with uh, small staffs, small treasuries that uh, need to handle very intensive manual processes, which uh, has, have, uh, let me say, an impact on the day-to-day -day level. And the third element, um, which is a bit, let me say, lateral, but I think very important, is that uh, especially in uh, moments of crisis like uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, many SMEs find more difficult to access uh, B2B markets, uh, uh, international B2B markets. And there is a, a very loud and clear ask from, uh, these, uh, um, from these companies uh, to the banks uh, and to the financial community to help them actually access the market. So it's not only funding, but it's also supporting them in their market scouting and market relationship. Now, why is this happening? I think here is uh, probably the biggest paradox uh, of uh, trade finance. Trade finance, as I think also someone was commenting in the Q&A box, trade finance is a market where actually uh, there always have been quite good innovation, especially in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, we have uh, some digital island, as they've been already defined, who are employing, which are employing uh, blockchain, which are employing artificial intelligence, which are employing uh, APIs. The problem is that uh, some of these uh, uh, islands have never really scaled up. The level of, ado of the option has been quite uh, low. Uh, and still, uh, the vast majority of the market uh, relies on manual processes, legal te uh, legacy technology, and uh, uh, very, let me say, old and established processes. Now, we have uh, looked at uh, potential solutions for this. Uh, and uh, we have started uh, with a vision. And uh, you know, I mean, there could be different ways of envisioning how this could work in the future. Uh, we have uh, embraced a vision that uh, does not look as uh, some like uh, new global platform, but rather a vision that builds on what is existing and tries to connect these digital islands. So if we look at, uh, how we would like to see trade finance business working in 10, 15 years from now, we see the island still existing, but not being, let me say, separated, being actually connected. So that market participants, the dots that you see in this, in this picture, can easily connect to the different networks. Each network could provide different services, use different technologies, but speak a common language across them. And this common language uh, should reside in what we have called the interoperability layer, which is a virtual construct, I, I will uh, elaborate in a minute, uh, that is, let me say, responsible for creating, maintaining, and updating the language. Now we will uh, uh, explain what is the language about. Uh, I will anticipate that language means business language and technology language, because we need both, let me say, to make this work. And we believe also that uh, with this construct and with the common global business and technology language for trade finance, there could be the opportunity also to dramatically uh, drive down the costs of transactions, as also Mr. Yu and Mr. Fung were uh, discussing previously, by using uh, uh, global shared utilities. Because if there are, let me say, common data models that are understood by all the market participants, then there could be global utilities, for instance, that could uh, perform a real-time credit assessment based on those data models. Uh, and this credit assessment could be used by multiple market participants. Or we could think about uh, uh, company identifiers, for instance, at global level that are uh, uh, shared at the at market level and uh, where you have uh, utilities that manage the maintenance and the exchange of information around this company identifier for instance easing the kyc and onboarding of new players into the into this uh, uh, environment now what is needed to achieve this these are the building blocks that we have envisioned first of all starting from the bottom 
we believe that is the need for what we call digital trade enablers. These are enablers that uh, go beyond the pure financing part of trade finance. So they are uh, helpful for trade as a whole, also for instance, for the logistics part of the trade. And these are basically two in our vision. A globally recognized company identifier to solve, uh, let me say, issues around uh, understanding who you, are, you have on the other side of the transaction and the standards for digital trade documents. I will not comment uh, with technicalities, but uh, these are two areas. You see them colored in uh, gray, which means there are solutions which are ready to market and uh, that have been already, let me say, um, adopted and seconded by some organization. Let me comment, for instance, on globally recognized company identifiers, the global legal entity identifier, which, is, uh, which has, let me say, the back of a number of organizations. The second block is trade finance interoperability foundations. This is the mix of the business and technology language that is missing for trade finance to be interoperable. And there we see three boxes. First of all, trade finance is a difficult business. When you speak about supply chain finance, for instance, different banks mean slightly different products. When you speak about uh, invoice financing, it could have, let me say, different means in different countries, right? So the first thing is uh, start from a product taxonomy and uh, that, that will give uh, transparency in the market and it will be commonly recognized across the different market participants. Here, there are some, uh, uh, some standards in the market that are existing that could be integrated to be, let me say, more robust and complete. The second element is uniform trade finance data models, right? So how do you represent uniquely a trade finance transaction with a proper set of data? How do you represent a trade finance counterparty with a proper set of data, which is always the same and shared by the market participants? This is missing. Some industries have uh, highly uh, got a very high benefits from defining this. For instance, in capital markets, this is pretty standard. And uh, we believe that this should be one of the very first building blocks of the target ecosystem. And then the third, standards for trade finance APIs. So a technology language of uh, interconnecting the trade finance technology systems between the different uh, digital island so that uh, a market participant can access uh, in the same way to different uh, uh, digital networks that are providing the same or even different services. Mm -hmm. This is also missing. We see some markets like uh, Europe with PSD2, UK with the, um, with the UK Open Banking Initiative uh, that have uh, highly benefit from uh, adopting uh, a market-wide uh, API standard. This is missing in trade finance, and this should be global, not at domestic level. And then the last box uh, is guiding principle for trade finance interoperability. So why the first two blocks, uh, we see them as a bit as uh, almost mandatory to create the ecosystem that we've seen in the previous page. There could be also the role for the interoperability layer to define some guidelines and best practices that could be adopted by market participants. And here we see, let me say, three types of uh, best practices. The first is blue books uh, for uh, trade finance processes and workflows. So how to optimize and make uh, streamlined uh, and cost-efficient uh, trade finance processes using uh, AI, omnichannel offering and the like. The second is uh, best practices for sustainable trade finance. Here is where also the ICC is doing uh, some very relevant work, but uh, we need, uh, let me say, a more, uh, uh, more agreed understanding of, for instance, what do we, do we mean by green trade finance and what are the financing practices behind this. Uh, and the third is uh, we've spoken about uh, uh, shared utilities, global utilities. Of course, there couldn't be a, a mandate for global utilities, but there could be guidelines and best practices for setting this up uh, and let me say advocating the market for creating this. Uh, before closing, uh, I would like, let me say, also to make a call for action. So we believe there is the need to establish this interoperability layer. 
It could be an organization, it could be a network of organizations, it could be a, an advisory group, but it must be something with uh, the mission of doing three things. First of all, if we start from the bottom of the previous page, promote adoption as, at scale of the existing trade finance standards for operational interaction. So we said that global recognized company identifiers, standards for digital trade documents, trade finance product taxonomy is, are already there, can be fine-tuned, but really need to be adopted quickly by market participants, especially on the supply side. So banks and their technology providers to enable the demand. As Mr. Fung said before, it's a game of adoption of both sides, but we believe there is a responsibility from the financial services market to drive this, especially on what is already existing. The second element mm -hmm. of the mission of the interoperability layer would be to design and disseminate the additional trade finance standards and protocols to fill the market gaps. So what is uh, colored here in black in the middle block, the standards for the APIs and the uniform trade finance data models. Someone has to take the responsibility for defining this globally. And this is a critical technology and business language missing piece for this ecosystem. And the third mission is uh, playing a bit as a think tank, as we were saying, in defining the guiding principles, the best practices, the blue books uh, that can be adopted uh, by market participants if uh, objectives number one and two are already achieved. These, of course, will have uh, benefits for all the market participants. I will, for the sake of time, I will not comment, but you find all the details and all the uh, elaborate in the report. Let me leave you with a comment around the timing, right? So we started this clock, let me say, in November, December of last year. So we believe that uh, this year and the first uh, six, nine months of the next year will be critical to mobilize the existing trade finance ecosystem. And I think that uh, events and discussions like these are critical to create the consensus and to mobilize the, the players. This includes also establishing the governance for the interoperability area. We believe that uh, if this is done well, in the next two, three years after the first wave, the reconceived ecosystem could start to be developed and begin scaling up adoption. And then we believe that uh, in additional five to 10 years, uh, this could be a completely different ecosystem, which is important, is meant to stay for many decades. Eh? If we look at the technologies that are being used today in trade finance, some of these were established in the 70s, if not before. So mm -hmm. this could be an ecosystem that stays for four or five decades. So it's, let me say, a mission of a generation of finance, financial service uh, um, executives to redefine this for the future. I hope, let me say, I have balanced like, uh, the, the, the time with the, with the details uh, and uh, I leave it for the rest of the panelists uh, and the Q&A. Happy to take any question, of course. Thank you, um, Alessio. And um, really delighted to uh, turn our attention to the panel today. Um, my name is Pamela Mar, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm joined by a very uh, expert group of panelists. I'd like to um, go back to the pain points. I mean, a number of times we've referred to the pain points uh, faced by SMEs in um, accessing trade finance. And I'd like to first turn to Natalie. Um, can, you, uh, can you remind us what are these pain points um, the major ones, and why have we as um, an industry been unable to address them, even though the technology has been around since the 1970s? Um, mm -hmm. and, and what are the strategies that we are using today? Um, and, you know, the more uh, color, uh, colorful and specific you can be, um, of course, it would be appreciated by everyone. Thank you. Go ahead, Natalie. Thank you, Pamela. Um, the barriers, as Eddie and Victor have already highlighted, and Alessio are very well known um, about serving especially SMEs. Um, and the industry has been working hard with those tech enablers. Um, and I'll also touch on the ATF um, vision and how that could really accelerate this necessary process. But firstly, the barriers, they're, they're very simple. I mean, the cost of onboarding, 
is the first one. Um, the cost for banks to conduct um, know your customer and wanting money laundering due diligence is high. It's still high. It's about 50,000 per client. And it's duplicative because every bank has to do it. There is not yet um, the shared utility. The second barrier is not just getting them on board, but then when you have your client on board, what is that cost to serve? Trade finance still being very heavily paper-based that creates additional complexity, inefficiency, um, and risk because it's manual and judgmental. And then finally, there's the, um, the heightened credit risk, which is known obviously from SMEs, which is reflected in their higher default rates. There's just not enough meaningful digital data yet to differentiate between good and bad risk propositions, nor risk mitigation tools readily available that can make them viable. So as Victor highlighted earlier, all of this combined really does result in that increased trade finance gap of around $1.7 trillion. And it hits those SMEs the hardest. So those are the sort of the barriers. You asked me, Pamela, to be specific about the actions. I can talk about the actions that the banks are taking today. And HSBC, as the number one trade finance bank, we take that position very seriously. And we see ourselves as responsible, not just for our own business, but for the industry and all that we serve. In the last two or three years, addressing that cost of onboarding, HSBC is the first bank to automate KYC and the AML checks and trade finance. And we're also making use of third-party shared utility services such as SWIFT. We are actually seeing greater use of the digital identity tools that provide verifiable, transparent, and accessible data. That makes that customer due diligence easier and more efficient. On the cost to serve, we're taking advantage of increased digitization. Actually, that's had a real bonus through COVID because the e-penetration rates have gone up significantly. We're now at 84%. And digitization helps make that trade easier and more accessible. For example, trade as a service, providing finance at point of sale. Those APIs, Alessio, that you talked about, providing SMEs with that quicker, more transparent access just simple mobile trade trackers that help SMEs get instant information on the status of the trades. And then we've talked about blockchain, which is the distributed ledger technology, providing that single verifiable, secure, immutable moment and source of truth. But that makes it faster, safer and more efficient, getting velocity into that working capital and therefore trade. And on the credit risk, that digitization that Eddie was talking about, that digital data decisioning, that also provides data that will enable us to automate that credit decisioning using real-time transactional data, not some historical one-stop photo of a, of a sort of a balance sheet and, and sort of accounts. Um, and by its nature, it's actually more accurate. So that will actually zoom in on much more sort of um, accurate decisioning. And um, with the age of development, we've broken the mold for public-private partnerships. This is another way of sharing that and distributing that sort of risk, enabling us to go much deeper into um, supply chains. And again, COVID was an accelerator for that kind of thing because the pressure and the urgency around getting the PPE and the vaccines um, distributed really was an opportunity we clearly could not miss. And then if you sort of put on top of that what the ATF vision is, I really believe that this can accelerate the adoption at scale of um, very similar to Alessio's comments, some of the following critical trade finance standards. So that globally recognized company identifier that will reduce the cost of onboarding and enable the setup of global shared utilities. The standards for the digital trade documents um, that will result in a more rapid shift to the paperless trade, reducing that cost to serve and then the trade finance product taxonomy and data models and that will increase that transparency enable that interoperability across multiple channels and platforms and critically it will help trade finance be created as an asset class um, where we can get much greater distribution um, and that again will also increase the sort of um, the trade finance supply and velocity so that's my answer to your question, Pamela. Um, there's lots to be done, but we're on the journey. And um, Hong Kong, with their sort of initiatives, brings all this together, actually. And we're absolutely thrilled to be part of those um, proof of concepts. Hey, thank you, uh, Natalie. It's a, a great reference to Hong Kong because um, I'd like to ask Howard, based on your experience dealing with uh, SMEs in Hong Kong, 
Um, can you um, add to or uh, reflect on what Natalie has said, um, particularly given that you, know, you supervise uh, all the banks and some will always go first, some will always digitize sooner, some will always have more outreach. How do you deal with uh, the fact that there is uh, so much disparity in the market? And is there a role for uh, the regulator or uh, for policy in enabling a faster pace of change? Well, thank you very much. I think this is a very important question. Uh, very often, it's not just the technology, but it's the processes and then the changes that need to be made in order to adopt these technologies. Just like many of you, maybe you have, the, you have had the experience of introducing system changes in your company, bringing in a new piece of uh, application. Uh, one of the application could be well-tested, very good, well sort of a standard application. But when you need to introduce that into your organization, you need to change a lot of processes. A lot of people will need to do things differently in order to adopt the application. That's the biggest, the most difficult part, just like what we, a lot of us are doing in terms of digitalization. So the key word is how to really mobilize everybody in the ecosystem to make the jump and to make the leap uh, in order to adopt and embrace this kind of technology. And as alluded to earlier, we, we need to have a, both a push and pull uh, effort in this. Uh, in terms of uh, a pool, uh, obviously we will need to enable everyone, every participant to see the benefit, to see the value in this. Now, uh, we cannot have this all at the same time. Uh, we need to have a general education but we need to have some early wins, some low hanging fruits to prove to the world and the participants that if you are taking a lead, uh, probably you would reap the same kind of benefit as well, uh, such that there's very tangible benefit for them to see. This is very important. And we also need to have some kind of push as well, uh, where we have a handle. Uh, just I'm using the CDI that we are doing as an example. Uh, you mentioned we are bank regulator, we regulate all banks in Hong Kong. So we see this as a tremendously um, beneficial public good. That's why we actually wrote to all banks. And we, uh, I would fall short of the word of require them, but strongly encourage them to make connection to CDI uh, to make use of the CDI for their business and then try to gather information, get the data. And one important thing is also, as you will see, there could be cases where there will be bilateral arrangement between a bank and a data provider, which is pretty simple. But, if, but you can imagine if different banks do this bilaterally, and then we will again end up in sort of a different data island. Uh, it would be most beneficial to the ecosystem as a whole, that everyone come on board instead of going through a lot of exclusive bilateral connection, but everybody connect to everyone. And then we can, um, not competing on a very low level that depending on how much data provider you can sign up to, but on a much higher level that we all can have access to a vast amount of data and then you compete on your ability to make the most out of this data lake. So this is something that we are pushing as regulators. So going back, process changes, uh, low hanging fruit, and then uh, sort of uh, use some push uh, where necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Howard. Um, Andrew, uh, turning to you, you've uh, actually looked at this issue for a number of years and I probably uh, uh, since, the, um, since the launch of the ICC trade register, um, can you uh, can you like shed light on what are the things going on at the global policy level which can help um, provide support to catalyze the change that we're seeking and where do you see those happening um, particularly in the next year you know at the G20 level APEC level ASEAN all of the above um, because we it's it's essentially where should we be uh, where should we be throwing our support. Um, in, in, in terms of policy. Thank you, Pamela, great question. So I think that there have been 
if you like, no shortage of, of policy interventions to support the trade finance market, certainly since the global financial crisis. We've seen many efforts to backstop the trade finance market through regional and multilateral development banks, all of which are incredibly positive. We've seen the emergence of, of standards like the Global Legal Identifier uh, standard endorsed by the G20 maybe almost a decade ago. But I think what we essentially need is a, a concerted understanding amongst policymakers, particularly at the G20 level, that trade and trade finance are particularly vital coming out of this crisis. We saw yesterday the, the um, International Monetary Fund downgrading the outlook for global growth quite significantly, particularly in developing regions. We know from data within our network that the outlook for SMEs is particularly bleak in many developing economies. We, we frequently see survey results showing that between 30 and 40% of small businesses think they'll be out of business within six months without adequate support. So I think it's important that particularly the G20 and other international institutions recognize that trade and by extension trade finance will be very much a vital source of stimulus coming out of this crisis. It's important at the macro level for, for uh, restoring global growth. It's also very, very important at the firm level in terms of just maintaining the viability of small businesses as stimulus fades from the economy. And I think what we, what we don't need necessarily is a patchwork of sporadic interventions, but a consistent vision from the international community. And I think what the report from the ATF uh, very clearly sends is the need for that integrated, cohesive agenda that we can all get behind, both from the public sector, but also the private sector. Okay, and um, just uh, taking that one step further uh, to talk about what does interoperation actually look like? Um, how, how do you see that happening? You know, that we're gonna let um, all these solutions and all these pilots and platforms um, basically uh, develop because they're uh, market responses to existing problems. And at the same time, ensure that there's that interconnection taking place. What would you like to see? Um, I mean, uh, on a global level, Stephanie. you know, also uh, feel free to let us know how this is going at the Digital Standards Initiative um, in Singapore, if that's relevant. It most certainly is. And I think, I think our experience over the past 18 months through the Digital Standards Initiative has, has shown to crudely paraphrase Chairman Mao that a hundred or hundreds of flowers have bloomed in the digital space, but the net effect mm -hmm has been for digitized trade to wither on the vine. And I think we need to get very, very serious in addressing the proliferation of digital islands. Yes, innovation, new platforms, new solutions are all good things, but they need to be developed in a way that is internationally consistent. And I think as Eddie said earlier, interoperability is very much uh, the key to that. So essentially what we're trying to do through the Digital Standards Initiative is to look at how do we bring some degree of convergence using ICC's convening power of all these different new initiatives and also the public and private sectors and force convergence or force that interoperability layer in terms of data models, in terms of standards for documents, in terms of APIs. And I think that is very much what is needed and what is missing. And I think what we've seen from the DSI's work over the past 18 months is it is increasingly bringing together companies across the supply chain. And I think that is really the key point and our, our key message in many respects that the solutions to digitizing trade and addressing the trade finance gap can't be addressed in isolation. It's not necessarily something the banks can address alone. It's not something logistics firms or commodities firms can address alone. We need consistency across the value chain and across countries recognizing the uh, interconnectedness of the, the global economy and the intrinsic interconnectedness of international trade. Okay, thank you. Um, Howard, I see you nodding. Um, what is the role uh, to be played by Hong Kong in enabling this um, interoperability um, all, all along the supply chain? Um, and that's noting that once everything's digital, it could actually be anywhere. So what's gonna be the role of Hong Kong in this? Uh, Hong Kong, our role has always been a great intermediary. Uh, 
especially now given that we are an international financial center, we have most of the major banks operating around the world having a presence in Hong Kong. Um, and also we are at the doorway of mainland China, which is of course uh, the biggest trading nation in the world. And a lot of the operations, the um, like the intermediary offices or companies are situated in Hong Kong. So I see we are in a pretty good position uh, to help digitalize uh, this uh, really um, difficult uh, part of the financial system. And um, that's what we have been doing through the different uh, initiatives that Eddie described earlier, the E-Trade Connect, the uh, CDI, and also the, uh, the, uh, also the uh, 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 Enbridge uh, CBDC project. Now, the, the important point is um, Hong Kong is also a very um, important pilot ground for a lot of initiatives. Uh, involving um, the mainland, like um, uh, as we have been doing in terms of Stock Connect, Bond Connect, in the sense that some of these issues might involve cross-border issue, uh, capital account control, flow of data. Uh, these could be pretty tricky issues, but uh, we hope to play a role in the sense that we can build the connection uh, between the, like the suppliers in the GBA, and also the buyers around the world using Hong Kong as a hub and then in a control environment uh, in the sense that we can provide a model uh, for the flow of information, the flow of money um, between the mainland and other parts of the world. I think that would be a great benefit that we can create for everybody in the ecosystem. So this is the direction we are heading uh, through the different projects that Eddie uh, has talked about. So I hope that um, we would also uh, work in collaboration with the AGI and uh, with your project. Uh, we are very happy to work more closely as to the adoption like, of the different uh, taxonomy and also the different standard, how we can start to be the one who can provide a little bit of uh, early win uh, by adopting this uh, kind of interoperability. And it's important that we together try to create a kind of a champion to have early adoption and then through this champion gradually extend to their connection, their network. Uh, I think that's very important and we, are, we, we would be looking forward to working together with you uh, on this. Okay, thank you, Howard. Um, Alessio, we, uh, during the research, this issue also came up you know, what does the interoperability layer look like? Is it a confederation? Is it an organization uh, like the WTO? Um, anything to add on what would be your kind of uh, suggestion for this panel on how do, we, how do we all work together to make the interoperability layer kind of a reality? So first of all, let me start from what uh, these constructs should not be. This will not be yet another uh, technology platform or digital island, right? Should be uh, a kind of uh, convening uh, entity that helps uh, the existing uh, networks and the market participants to connect each other by defining uh, and proposing the rules, as I, as I called before, the business and the technology language for the interconnection, right? So this, of course, could be an existing organization or a network of organization. I think that, uh, to be honest, uh, because there are some, uh, some uh, um, standards which are already there, we spoke about the global legal entity identifier. I see, let me say, this as a network probably of organizations or groups, but there must be some type of coordination. What I think is important is really that uh, the business uh, and the financial services community work together also with uh, regulators uh, and uh, uh, multinational organizations uh, to uh, create, let me say, this entity that has the, the three objectives that, uh, that we described before, right? And the fact that, uh, that uh, some of these 
standards are already there and just need, let me say, fine tuning and push for adoption. But also the fact that, as we heard from Natalie, for instance, uh, some, uh, let me say, uh, leaders in financial sectors are already experimenting with some of these technologies is very encouraging in the direction of uh, uh, creating uh, the interoperability layer. Okay, thank you, Alessio. Um, let's turn to uh, talk about one of Asia's great challenges, which is sustainability and the net zero challenge. Um, it's been uh, broadly talked about that um, SMEs are the key to Asia achieving net zero. Um, Natalie, can you uh, help us understand what's the link between uh, solving the trade finance gap and um, you know, net zero and sustainability? Um, as you seeing it, as you are seeing it from the bank's perspective. Yeah, Pamela, I think this is going to be um, a new sort of front in the battle to support SMEs actually. I mean, when you consider global supply chains account for as much as 80% of the world's total sort of carbon footprint and emissions. And mm -hmm. then in turn within that SMEs will commonly make up at about 90% of any single supply chain. Victor was talking earlier when we were in our sort of green room virtual green room about his own supply chain. So they're really critical. Um, mm. So supporting them is going to be an absolute necessary enabler to get that net zero. We've recently done some research called Delivering Net Zero Supply Chains with um, Alessio, sorry, it was with BCG, not McKinsey. And, and that research revealed that there's going to be a hundred trillion of investment needed. Um, and up to about half of that is going to need to be directed to the SMEs. So if you compound that with the existing difficulties of getting trade finance to the SMEs, we've got a serious problem on our hands. And it's going to add a lot of complexity to those um, net zero challenges. It's harder to direct the funding to the SMEs. They've got um, much more limited resources and expertise, um, and they have um, lack of sort of knowledge and know-how and resources at the moment. So it is this new front. <coughs> areas I think that where we really need to sort of focus to support the SMEs make the transition. One of that is um, making the sort of um, the new climate technologies um, accessible and scalable to SMEs as soon as possible. That critical access to funding where obviously banks have got to play a role and then really there's a role to be played here in terms of sort of knowledge and collaboration which is effectively a big culture shift. Um, on the technologies, we've got to ensure that innovation and research and development is made available. In terms of financing, that's going to be, if we look at it end-to-end -end supply chains, um, we can then collaborate and co-create that full spectrum. Um, so if you take um, supply chain program, the big end of the scale are very, have got vested interest in going into not just tier one, two, but deep tier financing in um, transitioning those SMEs. Um, including access to sort of working capital and term finance. Transparency and data models and standards also will help bring public private partnerships together that we talked about earlier, which again will sort of support the SMEs with greater access. And then that need to sort of change culture and foster a sort of an ecosystem that promotes collaboration because no one individual team organization is going to be able to solve this on their own. It's unprecedented, a bit like sort of, um, the pandemic environment required collaboration, that will be a dry run and a rehearsal um, for what the, the sort of the, the climate change is going to challenge us with. And when you look uh, across industries, we look to automotive and textiles, 40 to 50% of that value is in the sort of the big player end. So they've got a vested interest to sort of incentivize and collaborate with their suppliers. But SMEs are already struggling. They don't know what the measure of success is. There's no standard. Um, there's going to be reporting requirements. Again, everybody's sort of setting their own. So we've got to pull this together and standardize these measurements and reporting standards to bring some consistency together, enable simplified data collection, um, and really to leverage some of these new technologies that exist, such as blockchain and the Internet of Things, to implement and monitor really targeted action as each um business has to transition okay thank you natalie uh, if i'm going to take the moderator's prerogative i would also add that it's not just the net zero uh challenge but also uh you know smes as the road uh, or as the route to solving asia's inequality and job creation 
um, issues, uh, especially noting that there are reports that, uh, that, that as a result of the pandemic, 75 to 80 million additional people have gone uh, under the poverty line. So we have a huge, huge task um, and we can't do it without the, uh, the SMEs. Um, Andrew, uh, the trade finance gap challenge is now dovetailing with the challenge of uh, running sustainable supply chains. And you've recently launched a new initiative on defining and setting a taxonomy for sustainable trade finance. Can you tell us what uh, will be the role of this uh, kind of uh, taxonomy or framework in contributing to solving uh, the trade finance gap for uh, SMEs and also for financial institutions? Thank you, Pamela. Um, really just to pick up on something Natalie said, and, and we, we completely agree with, with the analysis on the, the challenge of tackling scope three emissions or supply chain emissions. But essentially, the, the way we see this in, in economic terms is, for many years, the world, particularly in the UN climate process, has talked about the Nicholas Stern or the Lord Stern doctrine of the economics of climate change, which says taking early climate action results in positive economic outcomes for everyone. And I think that's, that's true at the macro level. But I think once you get down to the perspective of, of an SME at the micro level, you see actually the, the real challenge at hand is that taking climate action involves potentially short-term costs and potentially significant investments. And the surveys we've done through our, through our network, uh, engaging local chambers, have shown very clearly that SMEs need positive incentives, whether through supply chains or through their uh, financial institutions, to actually start taking action. So it's not a question of SMEs not being aware of the challenge. Yes, they lack technical skills. Many of the SMEs we've spoken to actually do want to do more, but there needs to be an immediate commercial return. And I think that's that's been one of the, the sort of um, key drivers behind our uh, work in the field of sustainable trade finance. How do we actually define sustainable, what constitutes sustainable trade and sustainable trade finance in a way that can start to reward those SMEs who are adhering to high social or environmental standards. So I think there's a, there's a real prize there. And the way we see this is there's an opportunity if we get the framework right to align what is at the very least a $5 trillion US, a US dollar market with the UN sustainable development goals. It's very, very challenging to do so, but I think there's also an imperative for the market to get behind this. And I think one of the challenges we have is we've now seen just as in the digitalization space, many individual institutions or fintechs or service providers, each defining sustainable trade in their, their own way. And I think that leaves the market very, very open to challenges around greenwashing. So I think if we want to provide those incentives with genuine integrity, we need the market to align behind common, robust definitions. And we very much hope that the process that we're leading, hopefully to completion at the end of this year, will help us get there. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, Howard, would you like to uh, add anything to this? What is the role of your fintech platforms in uh, enabling and catalyzing uh, the uh, drive to sustainable supply chains or even just a sustainable uh, GBA? Yeah, I, I think in terms of technology, I think it holds a uh, pretty good prospect in the helping to um, really track the uh, ESG performance, uh, a lot of things, in the sense that very often when we talk about greenwashing, whether talk about sort of um, uh, reporting, authentication, uh, is uh, pretty difficult, especially if you talk about sort of uh, 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 um, SME, and then it would be very difficult for no matter whether you're a lender, bond buyer, bond investor, to really um, understand where wh whether your money really are put into uh, a gainful and then the good uh, green users and ES, uh, conforming to US ESG standard. This is one thing that we are trying to uh, work uh, with the uh, BIS actually on a project uh, like, um, uh, like green bond issuance, whether we can uh, make use of technology 
uh, as some kind of reporting and tracking of the green performance of a project and then the, for uh, checking by investors. Uh, increasing transparency, I believe, would enhance investors' confidence and then would attract uh, more sort of uh, flows of capital into this. And then in return, that would create a more virtuous uh, cycle that would help uh, financing uh, by uh, the SME and, and any corporate indeed, uh, such that um, the kind of uh, uh, net zero effort uh, would be better funded. Uh, this is something that uh, I hope uh, either through our effort or through other sort of um, uh, digital platform, uh, making use of a uh, DLT technology, uh, we can give a better push uh, for this kind of uh, new technology um, in terms of uh, measurement and metrics. Okay, thank you, Howard. Um, Alessio, uh, anything to add? Where do you really see the opportunities to uh, kind of navigate the, um, the terrain of sustainability and uh, trade finance for SMEs? I think what we have, uh, let me say, not covered uh, so far is the fact that uh, a re reconceived ecosystem for trade finance uh, would open up uh, also the liquidity market, right? And uh, to institutional investors, for instance. So there was uh, a question uh, in, the, in the beginning uh, of, the, of the panel about, let me say, how can third parties enter into this world, uh, this trade finance market, uh, if it's basically a bilateral market, right? And, uh, but if we push this level of innovation uh, with uh, common and agreed business and technology language, data models, which are common uh, APIs and the like, it will be easier for market participants, not only on the demand side, but also on the supply side to join. So for instance, I'm thinking about export credit agencies that could uh, more easily partner up with banks in providing uh, uh, export finance uh, uh, instruments. I'm thinking about institutional investors that will be willing to finance part of uh, trade finance as an asset. Let me say, making trade finance an investable asset, uh, accessing uh, to this market. And of course, especially when you start looking at uh, institutional investors, sustainability and sustainability rating will be more and more important, right? And uh, a large part of the investment and the liquidity will be driven by the level of the sustainability of the specific transaction and of, let me say, the counterparts, right? So I believe that uh, to foster this, uh, let me say, uh, broadened ecosystem on the supply side uh, with more financial participants, it will be critical also to uh, embed the sustainability element in it, uh, not just because it's important for the planet, but also because the institutional investors are increasingly looking at this. Okay, thank you, Alessio. So actually what you're saying is that we're trying to uh, so-called uh, drive inclusivity on the borrower side with SMEs. And we're also trying to use interoperability to drive inclusivity from the investor side as well. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, let's uh, turn to, let's get really practical and let's talk about what we wanna see in 2022. Um, because we, you know, we, we, to have a vision is one thing to actually, you know, do something about it is um, an entirely uh, different affair. So um, uh, let's just go around and uh, tell us what, you would like to see happen with regard to progress toward the interoperability vision in 2022 and who you think the key stakeholders are to, uh, you know, so that we know who do we need to get on board and what will, what will be their remit? You know, what, think about the resources um, and stakeholders. And so um, who would like to start? Um, maybe uh, Natalie, go ahead. <laughs> Pamela, thank you. So if you're inviting me to start about the stakeholders, why don't I start high level then? Um, and given who we are in trade finance, we really do take that leadership responsibility very seriously. So we actually engage a lot with the, the global sort of um, policy forums, such as the B20, the WTO, et cetera, promoting, exchanging ideas and making recommendations. The three I would sort of zoom in on, and they're all encompassed in, in the ATF vision, 
um, the ones that I think would make the biggest difference, I mean, they're quite basic, but I think they're really required, is the UNESCO trade framework, the legal identifiers, entity identifiers that we've talked about, and then the greater public-private partnerships for a whole host of reasons. UNESCO, that's the UN framework that um, governments can easily adopt that digitizes trade across multiple dimensions, including bills of lading, customs documents, um, all of that helps reduce that paperwork and that complexity and that sort of um, manual judgmental sort of risk. So far, it's only been adopted by five countries that have ratified this framework, although it is important to note that China is one of the early adopters. If we could just get widespread adoption of that one, it would really help standardize and digitize trade. So that's the first one. The second one is really perhaps enforcing and extending the scope of those legal entity identifiers to SMEs. We've discussed the benefits of it around KYC, AML, the digital um, credit decisioning. Currently adoption is pretty patchy at a corporate level, but you could get government action to formalize um, its use. And if we could get that, that would be um, another big sort of step change. And then thirdly, that greater use of public-private partnerships, given the higher default risks associated with the sort of SMEs, um, you can have limited appetite for that financing and hence it sort of um, compounds into that trade finance gap. If we just get more involved with the multilateral banks, and sort of share that sort of risk, you can get more financing into the system than would otherwise be possible. We've proven it. There's a, there's a sort of, um, we broke the mold. We've got a template there that we can lift it and shift it. Um, when we did the work with the um, Asia Development Bank supporting um, the PPE and the vaccines during COVID across supply chains. So it's a model, we need to set a new standard um, and then we can just sort of widely replicate that. So those would be my three. Thanks, Pamela. Okay, thank you, Natalie. That sounds like a, a really good start. Um, Howard, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Natalie has just given a very good overview, broad macro level of the key tasks involved. Maybe I try to approach it from the other end of the equation, uh, in the sense that while we, we have put in place all these framework, uh, taxonomy, everything, uh, I go back to what I described as we need to prove to the participants that there's something in it for everyone. And perhaps uh, other than the structure and the system in place, it's important to get a few key players in each particular sort of note, so to speak, uh, like a bank, like uh, HIVC was a big player there and some uh, big uh, connectors who suppliers and buyers, such that we, we don't need to be very ambitious on day one in the sense that we want to roll it out, roll the standard out to the whole industry all at one go. But try to bring a few key players, some anchor players there and get them on board and then try to provide a sort of a, a, a work through end to end solution that we can create Mm -hmm. and then let people see how this would work. And then through this anchor player, this is a technology champion, gradually extend it to their connection, either by sort of encouragement, persuasion, or coercion, whatever you name it. And then uh, we, we take it from there. And as a, a regulator here, as a platform builder in Hong Kong, we actually we are building a few platforms as I, at the end I described. Uh, we are very happy to try to adopt as much as possible in our platform, but still we need to find ways to kind of persuade the users on the on the on the platform to adopt the new standard, the new arrangement. So I, I believe this is something that we really need to work together to find some influential anchor users for these new ideas uh, in order to prove it and then to disseminate. Uh, the, 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 the usefulness of the system or the uh, uh, arrangements uh, to, to, to the wider community. Okay, thank you, Howard. That's uh, so, uh, so practical um, and it almost seems uh, very doable too. So um, Alessio, what would you like to see in 2022 uh, towards the interoperability vision? First of all, I, I agree with uh, everything that has been said by Natalie and Howard. 
And uh, again, it's very encouraging to see the level of consensus uh, and uh, the, 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 the sharpness with which, let me say, the market uh, is, uh, is receiving this. Uh, what I would like uh, to see on top of, uh, of, the, of these ideas is one more thing, very practical. I would like to see 10, a, a common announcement by 10, 15 uh, of the leading uh, banks in trade finance, global, regional, and domestic, uh, about the fact that they're joining forces uh, to define uh, the uh, business and the technology language. So the data model standards and the API standards together with uh, the interoperability layer, whatever it will be, let me say, uh, and to adopt the standards to make trade finance a more uh, interconnected, interoperable, and inclusive market. Uh, and I think, I mean, there are some inspirations to this, uh, for instance, what has been happening in Europe uh, with PSD2, where uh, uh, banks have uh, spontaneously joined forces together to define the technical elements of PSD2 could be one uh, example of the how this collaboration could work. Thank you, Alessio. That sounds like a, um, a work plan for uh, your banking practice, actually. <laughs> so, um, Andrew. Thanks, Pamela. Well, I think I can, I can make one of Alessio's wishes come true immediately by saying that through the DSI, we will be uh, pursuing a work stream this year, which hopefully will come to fruition within the balance of the year to define that critical data model for trade and trade finance. So I hope that's good news, Alessio, and I hope you'll uh, continue to be supportive of that, that work. I think just to, to put this more broadly, I think Eddie spoke earlier about uh, the need for a sort of team Hong Kong mentality. I, I almost wonder if what we really need in this ecosystem is sort of a mentality of team at global digital trade, um, which perhaps isn't so snappy, but I, I, what I, I think we would like to see is real convergence, both within industry, the financial sector and governments behind common standards and a drive to define those where they don't exist, but also to utilize them. So for instance, take legal identities, which we, we've spoken about frequently. There are only 1.9 million companies in the world that have a glyph-aligned legal identity, that is a pretty poor return on 10 years of effort. So how, through partnership across industry and with government, can we actually start to accelerate some of those trends? The other thing I think is very, very simple, and it's something for governments, but I think industry has a key role to play in making the business case, is adoption of the UN model law on electronic transferable records. So essentially giving proper legal recognition um, to e-bills of lading, for instance. Only eight countries have adopted that globally to date. The G7 has made a commitment to adopt uh, legislative reforms in line with the model law, but I think we need to see much more momentum there. And if you give proper rec legal recognition to digital documents, you increase confidence in e-trade solutions, you reduce the risk of legal disputes about who holds title to a particular uh, shipment, and you ultimately build confidence and, and um, usage of digital solutions and digital trade processes. So we think that is really fundamental. And if we could go from eight countries at the start of this year to 80 at the end, I think we'd be uh, on that S curve that Dr. Fung talked about earlier. Okay, uh, no small order. Um, okay, so uh, we've come to the end of the panel. I'd just like to thank um, Alessio, Natalie, Andrew, and Howard for enlightening us on the concept of um, interoperation as the key to solving the SME trade finance gap. And then also for uh, pointing out that this is an entirely doable task. We have the established trade, uh, paperless trade treaties. We have a model for uh, legalizing, uh, you know, paperless uh, cross-border trade. Uh, we have financial institutions who are on board with the vision and already starting to implement it. And we have a very supportive um, policy uh, and regulator uh, in Hong Kong uh, who is going to, uh, who is working to create that end-to-end, -end, you know, as Howard, you said, end-to-end -end example of how it can work and what would be the benefits 
for all the parties involved. So um, on a high note of collaboration and cross-sectoral uh, working together, uh, I'd like to conclude the panel and turn it over to uh, John Denton to uh, talk to us about the future of uh, trade. 